Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Avian Ecology Doubleheader. Um, first, I'd like to invite our first speaker, uh, Tori Bakley. Tori is a, uh, a native Floridian, having grown up in Merritt Island, and she attended uh, Florida State University, where she got bachelor's degrees in biological sciences, but also in anthropology. So um, Tori came to us with a huge amount of experience, both in uh, local sort of wildlife-based NGOs, uh, but also in international wildlife research and conservation. Um, she, she had lots of experiences in undergrad at FSU, including having the opportunity to do an independent project, which is what brings most people to Archipel in the first place. She did that project on uh, the morphology and locomotion of squirrels. So um, after she graduated, Tori pursued one of her lifelong dreams and went to Borneo in Indonesia, where she studied orangutans in the forest, in the jungle um, for a full year. And it was there when she got to actually watch and appreciate the avian diversity in the jungles of Borneo that she decided to really focus on birds. When she came back, she went out to Hastings um, Reservation in California, where colleagues of ours have been working on another cooperative breeding species, the acorn woodpecker for many years. And Tori worked there for a year, again, doing another independent project. And she's been with us since January. And she's gonna stick with us for a little bit longer because she's um, gonna be a seasonal research associate at our long-term work at Avon Park Air Force Range. So Tori was here during a somewhat <clears throat> unusual year. And uh, she got really interested in sort of the dynamics of that year. And with that, <clears throat> I'm going to let her tell you about it. Tori, over to you. Thank you, Reed. Um, so as Reed said, I'm here to present the causes and impacts of the 2021 boom year um, for Florida scrub jays at Archibald Biological Station. So if you aren't already familiar with the Florida scrub jay, these are the most pertinent facts you need to know for this presentation. They're an endemic species to Florida, meaning that they're only found in Florida's scrub habitat. They're a federally threatened species due to habitat loss and population decline. The population of jays here at Archibald Biological Station have been studied for over 50 years, which provides a plethora of long-term demographic and ecological data to utilize. They're a cooperative breeding species and this means that their young from previous years often stay with the parents and help with future nests until they find a breeding opportunity of their own. They'll be helpers for about two to five years before breeding, and they usually only leave their natal territory once a permanent breeding position is found. For about two, to obtain a breeding position, a jay must acquire ter territory. And a territory is simply a section of habitat that's defended by a single pa pair of jays who may or may not be accompanied by their offspring. There are four methods of territory acquisition that are defined by Wolfenden and Fitzpatrick. Budding is when an offspring buds off from its parental territory, obtaining a section of territory from its parents along with some neighboring territory. Buds are typically small in size because they're brand new, but will hopefully be grown larger over time. De novo, which is Latin for a new, occurs when two paired jays defending a previously uninhabited area distant from either parent's either bird's parental territory. This will also start off small with the goal of growing it bigger. Territory is inherited when an offspring, typically a male, gains possession of its parent parent's territory due to the death of its father and subsequent loss of its mother. Inherited territory is generally larger than budded or de novo because it has already been established for some time by its parents. So the goal uh, for that jay is to just maintain those boundary lines. Replacement occurs when one jay uh, joins a divorced or widowed jay at their established territory. Divorce is very rare and usually only occurs when a pair fails to acquire a territory and, and splits apart. Just like inherited territories, replacements are larger since they are already previously established. This distinction between territory size is important to note because larger territories are known to have higher reproductive success. It's also important to note that de novo is rare, usually only occurring in about 4% of new territories and breeder replacement is common, occurring in about 50% of new territories. Now that we know what new territories are, let's talk about how they're related to boom years. The term boom is typically used to describe a rapid increase of something. 
For a federally threatened species, observing a boom of any kind can be noteworthy. An un unexpected increase in new territories for the 2021 breeding season is the driving force behind this whole study. As my coworkers and I continued to find new breeding pairs throughout the station study area at the beginning of the breeding season, it became apparent that something unique was happening during this breeding season. This led me to question what makes this year special and what patterns could we find if we go back through the historical data. On average, there's about a 7% increase in the number of territories at Archbold for the breeding season, but uh, 2021 saw about a 26% increase in territories. So for this study, we defined a boom year as a year that experiences an above average increase in breeding pairs. This leads us to my hypotheses. First, what conditions led to a boom year? I'd predict that the increase in breeding pairs is associated with a large amount of available habitat burned within the last one to six years. Jays prefer to occupy habitat that's been burned within that time frame. So I would expect a correlation where more area burned means that there's more available habitat, which also means that there's more room for more jay territories. I'd also expect an association with a large proportion of two-year-old birds in the population, since that's the youngest age that they typically disperse to breed. I'd also expect to see a low density of territories prior to the breeding season, which would allow room for a spike in density. Second, I want to know what are the consequences of a boom year? I'd like, I would expect increased territory density along with an increase of the proportion of novice breeders because of those young two-year-old birds that are dispersing for the first time. I'd also expect a change in the route to breeding and the proportions of each territory acquisition method. Uh, new territories must mean that there's a lot of buds and de novos, um, like more than normal. So I would expect a negative change. I'd also expect a negative change in reproductive rates since new breeders in small territories have less reproductive success than experienced breeders in large territories. Let's take a closer look at what I classified as a boom year in order to select my data. I chose to analyze only the last 10 years, which was still a lot of data, um, but the graph on the left shows the increase in number, the num number of J's in territories each year. As you can see, those two don't always move equally since there are many J's that are not breeders, thus not impacting the number of territories. The graph on the right shows the percent change in number of breeding pairs per breeding season. I circled the peaks that correspond with boom years and all of the other years I consider as average years. Um, we can see that even compared to other boom years, 2021 saw a very large increase in breeding pairs. For my analyses, I compared the variable means of boom years and average years, along with the means in relation to territory acquisition method, each through one way ANOVAs. On the left, you'll see the comparison of percent area burned um, between average years and boom years. And on the right, you will see the historical years compared to 2021. Time since fire was statistically insignificant between boom years and regularly, regular years. And while it's statistically insignificant, we can see that 2021 maybe had a slightly different, uh, was slightly different from the average, but still on par with boom years. So 2021 wasn't necessarily unique in that, um, in that aspect. Uh, for two-year-old breeders, looking at the graph on the left, 2021 had over 52-year-old breeders with over half of them using the de novo method, which is that orange chunk on that bar right there. Um, that means that over 80% of the new breeders this year were two-year-olds. And although two, of our boom years 2013 and 2021 did have a large number of two-year-olds. This was not statistically significant for boom years. Uh, I think they averaged out there. Uh, the graph on the right shows the proportion of each method completed by a two-year-old. So the number of two-year-old J's in each method was statistically significant with buds being completed by two-year-olds uh, most often. So although there was no significant differences between the years, we did find a significant correlation between dispersal age and acquisition method. Territory density. So the density during breeding season proved to be statistically significant as expected. The density prior to the breeding season was not significant, even though it did appear as though boom years had slightly lower densities prior to the breeding season. 
Um, but these graphs just show the density during breeding season. We can see that 2021 aligns with other boom years in this aspect. So again, it's not necessarily unique or different from other boom years, but it is still a boom year. I did find that the proportion of novice breeders per each territory acquisition method was statistically insignificant between years, even though it appears that boom years usually have a larger proportion. But it is important to note that the 2021 uh, was even higher than the average and was also higher than the boom year average. And this suggests that 2021 might be unique in the number of novice breeders that it did have. The use of replacement and de novo methods was statistically significant between boom years and average years, whereas de novo, or sorry, bud and inherent were not significant. Replacements are typically much more common than any other acquisition type, so it makes sense that this low percentage would be significant. Not only is replacement not the most used acquisition type in 2021, it's also less common during our defined boom years as well. So yeah, really interesting. The average number of fledglings produced per pair was significantly correlated between boom years and average years, but insignificant between acquisition method. So this difference in total fledglings produced along with the percentage of breeding pairs that had fledglings were also insignificant to our year types. Since this wasn't quite the outcome I expected, I expected it to have like a reduced um, reproduction rate. It leads me to consider what other factors influence um, nest success in boom years. I know that was a lot of graphs, so let's review it really quick. Time since fire and area burned and the number of two-year-old jays was not significantly correlated with our increased breeding territories. 2021 had an unusually high proportion of novice breeders, although it was statistically insignificant. Uh, territory density was correlated with increased jade territories during the breeding season, but not prior to the breeding season. So it wasn't necessarily lower than normal, but um, in line with the other years. The commonality of territory acquisition methods did change significantly between boom and average years. And the number of fledglings produced per breeding pair between boom and average years was significantly correlated. I know this sounds like the end of my presentation, but there's actually a second part of my study that I would like to cover prior to diving into a discussion. Since territories acquired by different methods have different characteristics and maybe different upkeeps and requirements and needs, is J behavior impacted? Since breeder males are the most dominant in their family, Stalk Up and Wolfden, Wolfenden found that they also deliver the most food to their nest and they also spend the most time defending their nests and territory, and essentially they have the most responsibility over the success of their breeding season versus the breeder female or any offspring or helpers that they have. So this section of my study solely looks at novice breeder males. Since you can't breed without territory, I was curious if defending and growing territory would consume more time for birds in new small territories versus in bigger established ones. So I ask, does breeder male time allocation differ between behaviors based on the way that they acquired their territory? I hypothesize that the route through which a novice breeding male obtains his territory influences his subsequent parental investment. I expect that uh, males that obtain their territories through budding or de novo will dedicate more time to defending and growing their territory to increase future success and less time to nest provisioning. To study this, I followed first-time breeding males for one hour, once shortly after their eggs hatched, and again shortly after their nestlings fledged. I collected continuous data as their primary activities changed, noting the amount of time they spent doing each activity throughout the hour. The activities were divided into six types, foraging, sentinel, and sentinel just means that they're like on the lookout for threats, uh, territory defense, which means, uh, which might consist of chasing off other birds, nest defense, offspring provisioning, and other, which might include preening or other self-care tasks. Here we see this breeder male with a mouthful of bugs uh, to feed his little fledgling, which is right behind the twigs on the right. And I just thought that was a really cute picture. 
Although I just spent 10 minutes telling you how there were many new breeders this year, the number of novice breeder males that actually made it into my sample were relatively low, and not all territory acquisition methods could be fully represented in my data. So therefore, I couldn't actually run any statistics, but we can see from this graph below that maybe bud and de novo males appeared to spend more time defending their territory and less time as sentinel. Less time as sentinel means that the territory is going unmonitored for threats like hawks, snakes, or other intruding jays. Replacement males spent more time as sentinel and spent no time defending their territory. Is this because their territory is larger and more established? Are they less, are they not busy chasing off other birds? Are they, are their boundaries like stable? While this is an extremely small sample size, it would be really interesting to see if these patterns held true in the presence of more data. To wrap it all up, since fire didn't show significance in the study, what other environmental factors could have influenced the 2021 breeding season and other boom years? Maybe weather, habitat structure, longer fire intervals, or resource availability. Knowing what factors could prompt a boom boom are useful when making decisions regarding the management of threatened and endangered species throughout the state. Uh, boom years resulted in a shift in route to breeding methods and reproductive rates. I'd like to explore the reproductive rate more in the future because an increased rate could actually explain the whole purpose of a boom. Uh, my data didn't necessarily say that, but it would be really interesting to look more into. Um, and if a boom year does have higher reproductive rates, what proportion of those offspring survive to become breeders? And how is the overall population actually changed by a boom year in the long run? Overall, 2021 was unique in some aspects. The sheer number of novice breeders was higher than expected. And this could be due to a high number of birds that had been waiting for just the right time to become breeders, or possibly one of the environmental variables that I didn't check. The switch between increased de novo territories and reduced replacement territories was also noteworthy in since 2021's methods were used at incredibly atypical rates. Remember that replacement rate was super low whereas de novo was super high. Um, the preliminary behavioral data that I was able to collect on the novice breeder males suggests that it was worthwhile to continue these field observations into future breeding seasons to learn about how route to breeding impacts their behavior. Unless there are more boom years coming up or other special years like 2021, it will take a long time to accumulate a significant amount of data on the behavior of new breeders across every acquisition method. Special thanks to Reed, Angela, Meredith, Lynn, and the Archbold interns and staff for all of your help and support during this project. It's been a wonderful field season. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. And you can hear the audience applauding right now. <laughs> um, we've got a, at least a couple of questions. So uh, I, I'll pose those questions to you. And um, so let's see, uh, one question is, if, if you were to hypothesize another climatic or resource variable that might explain the boom year, what variable do you think is important? I think it would be interesting to look at food availability, look at um, like a, the amount of acorns that are there the year before, or even a few years before and see how that impacts the population. Um, I think food availability could also have a big impact on the nest success as well. Great. Um, Angela, congratulate you on great work. And she asks, um, did you look at breeder mortality prior to the boom year? Yeah, so I did look at that. It's not in this presentation. Um, I didn't find any significant um, correlations. It did seem like there was reduced um, breeder more or reduced breeder survival, so increased breeder mortality the years prior to um, these boom years. I think it would be really interesting to look into that. Um, it wasn't signif statistically significant, but there could be something there. Um, Hillary asks, can you control for hydrology? And I think what she's saying is suggesting that groundwater levels and maybe not so much rainfall in particular might be important. 
That would be really interesting. That's not um, something that I considered or looked into at all, but that would be a really interesting uh, thing to investigate in the future. It could influence food availability, insect abundance, things like that. So one of your compadres, James, asks, what's the difference between being divorced and being widowed for a J? Is one more common than the other? Yeah, so um, being a divorced J, d divorces aren't common in Js. They usually mate and they'll stay mated um, until one of them dies. Um, but um, yeah, so divorces are pretty rare. That usually only occurs when two Js, probably young Js, two-year-olds maybe, join forces, acquire a territory, and then something doesn't work. The territory, they just like can't lock that down. Maybe they can't defend the borders. Maybe the male isn't really up to his responsibilities as breeder male. And something happens and they split apart by the end of the breeding season and they divorce and they don't come back together ever again. It doesn't involve the death of either of them. Some, they just, it just didn't work out and they move on to other opportunities. Whereas um, a widowed J, its mate dies and then there's the possibility for replacement. So a J could come in and um, mate with that widow and then that's a replacement. They both um, can, sorry, yes. And that counts as a replacement. Josh asks, um, could boom years depend not so much on the total area of burn, but burns occurring in specific places, I am in a certain kind of habitat or things like that? Yeah, so jays are habitat specific in general. So they do really like they thrive in scrub habitat and open um, habitat. And so if we're burning in different areas or areas that aren't naturally these open scrub areas, they the jays might um, still just not really be inclined to move there if that's not what they're looking for. Um, I think that there's a lot of different aspects of time since fire and burning, um, area burned and stuff that we could look into and see um, what all could be correlated in there. And then I think the last question that we have is, do you have any theories? <laughs> Always be careful of questions that start like that. <laughs> do you have any theories for human factors that might affect how jays acquire space? Um, I mean, there could be the association of um, between jay territories and the presence of roads. And a lot of jays tend to like, like these open areas, especially out in the demo track here at Archbold. Um, they kind of like the fire lanes because they're open and they're sandy, they can cache food in the sand where, and it's also open so they can see um, predators and stuff really easily. So maybe the presence of roads or gaps could influence um, territory acquisition and also just habitat quality. So if people are um, not using land well, they're not managing land well, that's definitely going to impact territory acquisition. So if someone has a big plot of land and they're not burning it, it's just very overgrown. Maybe at one point it was Jay habitat, but they can't survive there anymore. No Jays are gonna move in until that um, area is managed correctly and um, could be classified as optimal habitat. Okay, well, I think we've done a good job of answering. Great job, Tori. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Reed. So I'm gonna introduce our, our next speaker. Um, and Bryce, maybe you can already go ahead and share your screen. But our next speaker is um, Bryce Lotion, who um, is originally from Colorado and bailed out of the far North and moved to Louisiana to, to conduct his bachelor's degree in science, natural resource ecology and management at Louisiana State University. Um, Bryce had also a lot of experiences, uh, but probably one of the most valuable experiences was actually becoming a member of a lab, a graduate lab, um, uh, and 
uh, he did that at Louisiana State U University, working with Phil Stouffer, who's a, a well-known ecologist. And that not only introduced him to a whole bunch of different experiences in the field, but the sort of academic culture of, of a research lab. So discussing research, both formally and informally in discussion groups, working with people in, with very, very different um, research questions and, and even species. So um, exciting to have had those opportunities. Um, after, after his uh, work, he uh, worked for the University of Illinois working on golden cheek war warblers. Um, in Texas, which is another endangered species. And there he got familiarity with a lot of the techniques that we use um, with our work in the Florida scrub jay. So Bryce has applied all of that to um, not only the work that he did for the lab, but his project. Now Bryce came in with a lot of curiosity and asked a lot of questions about things that had been done previously. And we talked at length about a project that had been done as a PhD well, back in the early 90s. And Bryce thought about it and came up with some new ideas and tried to replicate some of the work that was done back then under some different conditions. So Bryce, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And um, he's gonna tell you about a little bit about his work with Frisbees. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Reed. Um, and thank you everyone for showing up today. So yeah, as Reed said, uh, my project is about, um, I'm looking at the effect of habitat structure on the social learning of a novel foraging task in the Florida scrub jay. So um, first off, what is social learning? So the definition I'm gonna use is learning from others, not only from their actions, but also from the consequences of their actions. Um, and social learning has been demonstrated in a wide variety of taxa, including both vertebrates and invertebrates, Pretty much anything you can think of from mammals, birds, even fish and insects have shown a capacity for social learning. Um, there's a paper by Witten, which is a good review of the major discoveries. So in the past, social learning was traditionally focused on lab experiments, but um, the actual natural field might have differences than a lab experiment. So uh, over recent years, more and more field experiments have been done on social learning. And social learning has been demonstrated in natural environments for over 20 species, including a range of contexts such as foraging preferences, techniques, habitat choice, and predator avoidance. And as Reed talked about a little bit, one of those 20 species is the Florida scrub jay. So um, some research done by Peter Midford here at Archbold in the 1990s demonstrated social learning in the Florida scrub jay. So what? he did was he trained adult scrub jays to complete a novel foraging task, which was um, digging for peanuts inside of a ring. And then he compared the task performance of juveniles in families with a trained demonstrator to juveniles with no demonstrators. And what he found was that juveniles with demonstrators performed significantly better than the control group. And this graph over here, uh, kind of confusing with these different levels. But again, the big takeaway is that um, Juvenile scrub jays who had demonstrators for the task were much more successful at completing the task than the control group. So then some other research that has been done here at Archbold looked at habitat structure and perceived predation risk in scrub jays. So this started in 2010 from an intern in the avian ecology lab here named Dan Albrecht Mallinger, and it continued on with a few other interns in subsequent years. And they were looking at giving up density. Giving up density is a point where an individual considers the cost of continued foraging to outweigh the benefits. And the way they measured this is they would put out a foraging patch with a known quantity of food, and then they'd measure how long a scrub jay stayed at that patch and how much food was left when they left. And what they found was that giving up densities were higher, meaning there was more food remaining in the patch left over in more overgrown habitats. So this suggests that uh, scrub jays perceive a greater threat of predation in taller, denser areas. So in wide open habitats like this, uh, scrub jays can see all around and they can basically forage to their heart's content. But in taller, denser areas, they're more worried about predators such as hawks. So they're not gonna stick around as long and they will leave more food around. Even though there's plenty of food available, the risk of predation in their mind is higher so they decide to leave. 
So I wanted to see if this um, received predation risk also applied to uh, social learning in the scrub jays. So my questions, my first question was, does habitat structure impact the ability of Florida scrub jays to learn a novel foraging task from a four-step training process? And my hypothesis was um, that I predicted fewer jays in overgrown habitats would learn the task and take more trials to complete the training procedure compared to jays in open habitats. And furthermore, I would want to know if the habitat structure also would impact the ability of naive juvenile jays to learn the task by observation of trained demonstrators. And once again, I predicted a lower proportion of juveniles in overgrown habitats would learn to complete the task by observation of demonstrators. So what exactly was the task that I'm talking about? So I was replicating the training and demonstration procedure from that Midford paper in 2000, where I trained adults to dig for peanuts in the center of a ring, specifically in a Roby flying disc Frisbee, which is just a regular Frisbee, but hollowed out in the center. And I selected 24 J territories for training. I visit each territory once a week for four training trials. And um, individuals that were successful in the training process moved on to later become demonstrators for the second phase of the experiment. So every time I would visit a J territory, I would score every individual who showed up for the training trials on a scale of zero to four. Zero meant they were present in the study area. A one meant they would approach the ring, so they would be within one ring's diameter of the outside of the ring. A two, they would enter the ring. A three meant they dug somewhere in the ring but did not uh, get the peanuts in the center. And a four meant that they completed the task. They dug in the center of the ring and retrieved the peanuts. And then I compared this with habitat measurements of time since fire, and then a subjective estimation of the mean vegetation height and an estimation of pine density within a 25 meter buffer of where I was conducting the training. And so how I trained the Jays, there was a four stage training process that got progressively more difficult at each stage. And once a Jay completed a stage three times, they moved on to the next stage. So this year was the first stage with four peanuts, uh, just totally visible in the center of the ring above ground. And if they completed this three times, they moved on to the stage two, which was four peanuts partially buried um, partially visible, kind of hard to, don't know if you can see this here, that's what it looks like. After that, they moved on to stage three, which was one peanut uh, above ground with three buried underneath. And then stage four was the final stage, which was all four peanut pieces were completely buried underneath the sand. And if a scrub jay completed all four stages, they were considered successfully trained, which made them a demonstrator for the second phase of the experiment. So families that had at least one trained adult and one or more fledgling were visited once a week for up to eight weeks. Um, each visit, I conducted four of the final stage trials, which is where the peanuts were fully buried underneath the sand. And this was meant to coincide with the timing of the hatchier birds gaining food independence. So a scrub jay fledgling will mostly can forage on its own by about 60 days old, and they're fully independent by day 85. So the idea is they would be getting demonstrations of the task at the time when they were learning how to forage on their own. And here I'm going to show you a video of what a demonstration trial looked like. So you can see here that this is a breeder male in the foreground. He successfully completed the training and knows how to complete the task. In the background, there's a fledgling. And another one's going to come in soon. And so the male completes the task. Uh, the fledglings see it, but they're hesitant to go in the ring. And at the end, uh, the breeder female also comes in. But this can show that uh, entering the ring isn't, doesn't really come naturally to these jays. The, they're definitely wary at first. So that's what a demonstration trial looked like. So now we're going to get into what were the results. So going back to the initial training process where I had the four step training process for the adults. I analyzed training success versus sex and social class. So looking at sex, uh, males were significantly more successful at completing the training than females. About 60% of the males uh, learned how to complete the task, where only about 
25% of females learn to complete the test. And then social class, there were no significant differences, but it, um, breeders did perform better at training than helpers and juveniles. Uh, this was a very small sample size in helpers and juveniles, only five helpers and seven juveniles. And juveniles here is referring to uh, scrub jays that were a year old, but are still living in the territory with their parents are not yet considered helpers, not the fledglings that are born this year. So um, because there are significant differences in males and females, I split males and females for the analysis of training success. And I ran a one-way ANOVA and I was comparing training success with four different variables, which included um, time since fire and average scrub height, which were the habitat variables. I also looked at the number of training trials that the birds attended and the average trial interval, which is the average number of days between trials that a bird uh, attended for training. And for females, nothing was significant, but for males, the average trial interval did end up being significant. And here's what that looks like on a graph. So um, males who completed the training, who were successful, had a much low, had a lower trial interval than males who were unsuccessful at completing the training. And so what this number means, the interval between trials, so I visited each group once a week for four trials in that session. So if a bird was present for every session, it would be about 1.8 trial interval, seven divided by four. Um, so if a bird didn't show up for a week and missed all the trials, or maybe they showed up late or they left earlier, that's how they would get their trial interval would end up being higher. So I also wanted to look at for birds that were successful in uh, learning to complete the task, if there is any relationship between the habitat measurements and the number of trials it took for them to complete the training. So for this, I ran a linear regression and I looked at time since fire and scrub height versus the number of trials it took to complete the training. Um, neither ended up being significant, but there is a bit of a trend in time since fire. As time since fire increased, so longer since it's been burned, likely meaning a taller, denser habitat. There, did, there was a bit of a trend where it would also seem to take longer, more trials for the birds to complete the training process. That was my analysis for the training. So then the next phase was the demonstration trials where the trained birds were showing off the trial to the fledglings hatched this year in demonstrations. So again, I ran a one-way ANOVA. A lot of the same variables were the same with a few new ones. So I compared time since fire, average scrub height, the number of training trials, the trial interval. And then I also added in for fledglings, age at first trial, how old the fledgling was at the first trial they attended, the total number of trials that they attended, uh, the number of demonstrators in the group and trials with demonstrator, which was the number of trials that the fledgling was present where a demonstrator was also present. And the only things that ended up being significant were average trial interval, and total trials present. So here in graph form, up on top, you can see that fledglings that successfully learned how to complete the task were there for a greater number of average trials than fledglings that did not learn to complete the task. And then uh, similarly, as in the adult males, fledglings that successfully completed the task had a lower time interval between trials than fledglings who did not ever complete the task. And here I just graphed um, the fledgling success versus the three habitat metrics that I looked at. Um, but the conclusion really here, as I said, uh, none of them ended up being significant in predicting fledgling success. So back to my original hypotheses, my first hypothesis was predicting that fewer jays and overgrown habitats would learn the task and take more trials to complete the training procedure compared to jays in open habitats. And the result, uh, there was no difference in success rate or number of trials in different habitat structures. And furthermore, for fledglings, I predicted a lower proportion would learn to complete the task in overgrown habitats. Um, but again, the results were no difference in fledgling success compared to habitat structure. So, but what can we draw from this? So some discussion. So for the adults, um, it seems like habitat was not driving the difference in learning directly. Uh, there was a significant difference between males and females. And there also, while insignificant, there was a correlation where breeders were more successful than helpers and juveniles. 
So in a ScrubJ group, an reader male is always dominant over all the members, other members in the family. So this could possibly suggest that maybe more females and fledglings even knew the task solution, but just didn't get the opportunity to ever complete the task because possibly the breeder male always got first dibs because he was dominant and was hogging the ring and eating all the peanuts himself. So when we looked at analysis for males specifically, um, average time between trials was significant in predicting training success. So the more often that they showed up for training, the more likely they were to be successful. And for analysis of females, there were no variables that ended up being significant. So in the second phase of the experiment is when the trained adults were demonstrating the task to naive fledglings. Again, the habitat of the study area did not, was not significantly related with fledgling success, but the number of trials attended by the fledglings and the interval between trials was significant. So really it looks, seems like it's coming down to the quality of the training for the fledglings. So the number of times that they showed up to see demonstrations from the trained adults and how frequently the interval seemed to be the best predictors of whether or not they learned to complete the task. So while there's no direct relationship between the habitat measurements and um, the birds learning the task, I wanted to see if there was possibly an indirect relationship. So we saw that trial interval was significantly correlated in both adult males and fledglings. So I looked at um, the relationship between average trial interval and my habitat measurements. And again, none of them ended up significant. The best uh, correlation was time sense fire and the average interval between trials. So there's a bit of a trend here where as time sense fire goes up, the average interval between trials goes up as well. So this could suggest that while the habitat doesn't seem to impact their learning once they show up, at the trial area, they could, the habitat condition of the study area could impact whether or not they do show up. So if you remember, the average interval between trials goes up if they either don't show up for trials or they possibly leave early. This could have something to do with the habitat structure and that perceived predation risk. If they're worried about uh, hawks or pred other predators in that area, they may not stick around for training or demonstrations. And some considerations for possible future studies. This study could be continued long-term. You'd get a larger sample size. You could attest, assess the retention of Js over time if they still remember to, how to do the task. And you could compare the task learning in naive adults to naive juveniles. If um, adults move into a family where there's already a bird trained or maybe a trained bird goes and starts its own territory as we learned about in Tori's presentation. And you could compare learning in different habitats within the same family. So you keep the birds the same, but over different years, you could change exactly where the demonstrations take place in their territory, which would change the habitat metrics. Also, you could do the same study with multiple rings. This would put more opportunities for non-dominant birds to complete the task. So maybe more females or more fledglings. If they do know the solution, but just don't get the opportunity to complete the task because of a dominant male always being present, that could alleviate some of that. And we can also look at other factors on learning, such as the time of year, the reproductive stage of the Js, uh, whether or not there's a sentinel present. If there's a sentinel present, they might be less worried about predation and be fully focused on the training. And the idea of trusted demonstrators, does it matter uh, who is the one demonstrating? Uh, does it matter if it's a bird within that Jays family or a different family? Does it matter if it's a male or a female or a breeder or a helper? could look at all of that. So I just wanna say thank you to Reed, Meredith and everybody in the Bird Lab for all their help and support on this project. And thank you to everyone else I got to know here at Archbold, all the interns, it's been a terrific time. Uh, special thanks to former avian ecology intern, Derek Fucic. Some of you may have seen his seminar a couple of months ago. He was out there uh, collecting data with me, running some of the training trials. Uh, it really helped me out a lot. There was a lot to do training all those days every single week. So special thanks to Derek. And thanks again for everyone for coming. I'm uh, happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Bryce. Great job. It's everybody clapping. Uh, so let's see. We, uh, let me go into the chat and see if we've got a few 
questions. Uh, let's see here. Um, well, I have a question for you. Um, so do you think that group size might have an interaction with learning? Does, does the potential for increased social interactions somehow interfere with the opportunity to learn? So I didn't look at group size and learning at all, but I think there could, there could be a relationship. It could go either way. It could be that if there's a, a larger group it could lead to more demonstrators, which was not, number of demonstrators wasn't significantly correlated, but it was pretty close. And it seemed that more demonstrators did seem to mean more likely successful, but it could also go the other way is if there's a really large group, it could be a similar thing with like the breeder male hogging the ring. If there's a whole lot of competition for the task and it could make it harder for uh, other Jays to learn because they just don't have access they're being pushed out by other members in the group. Um, there are no other questions right now, Bryce. I guess uh, you explained it so well. Well, here's uh, one more just came in. Um, does Did food availability change over the course of your study? And could food availability, the sort of background ambient levels of food, affect your process? So um, I would say that it did, food availability did uh, change over the course of my study. So toward the end of the demonstration trials with the fledglings started to get more into August. And that's when the oak species here in the scrub start to produce a bunch of acorns. And uh, acorns are a major food source for the jays. And it did, this is anecdotally, I don't have data to back this up, but it did seem later on in the season, the jays were less motivated to complete the task possibly because they just have an abundance of acorns around. So it definitely that would be interesting to run the study over a full year and see if it changes. And that could one possible explanation for it, if it does change, would be the difference in food availability. A um, couple more came in. So uh, it would it be possible to know or account for food productivity in each Jay's territory. Uh, maybe Jay's with larger territories or more established territories might have more food and not necessarily be that concerned about learning the technique. Um, that would be an interesting, if you could, that is one way you could look at, you could look at territory size and see if that has any sort of impact. But yeah, if you could get even a more accurate measurement of how much food is available in that territory and compared to training success. That would be very interesting to look at, yeah. Yeah, especially since territory size and quality are, seem to be correlated as well. How long do you think the Jays retain knowledge of the training tasks? Would, would Jays be able to complete the training in future years if it wasn't reinforced along the way? So I know back, going back to Peter Midford's original experiment, he ran it for something like five years. And I think he visited every three months to check retention. And the retention rate was pretty good. I don't remember the exact percentage, but it was very high. Um, I don't know if you had a bigger gap than three months, if you waited say a full year till the next breeding season, what the percentage would be. But I definitely think some of them would still remember to complete the task. And then Chelsea Moore asks, do you think your presence had any effect on learning it? It seems like the Archbold Jays associate humans with food. Um, so definitely the Archbold Jays do associate um, humans with food and uh, peanuts specifically. I do think it would be much harder to train Jays probably at a different study site for the same task. It would probably take longer. You'd probably have a less, a lower percentage that would learn the task. I definitely think it, it is a contributing factor that they are used to being provided food by researchers out here. I think that does help in them being trained. And then I'll, I'll just ask the obvious question that you uh, sort of posed by your choice of pictures here. The, did any other non-target animals uh, learn this task? Snakes, so, bunnies, quails? 
A lot of these uh, pictures are from earlier stages in the trials where there's like peanuts uh, fully visible. But I do, I did have, I did have one toey that did go in and get some peanuts. Um, had a mouse, mouse. I think that was even a final stage, so I, maybe it was smell or something. Did did come in get some peanuts? Yeah, rabbits. Quail didn't eat any peanuts, just walked by. But yeah, that that was kind of fun. Sometimes when you're sitting out in the scrub for in the same place for a while, uh, you start to see some fun stuff. Well, again, thank you, Bryce. Great job, and uh, appreciate all the effort that both of you guys put into your projects and into the lab throughout the season. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Like us on Facebook and check out the Archbold website to find out our future seminar offerings and subscribe to the Archbold newsletter there, too. You'll find both of these under the News and Events tab. And we will see you soon. <laughs>